Hello, everyone. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Leadership. My name is Molly Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the University of Buffalo Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. This is week 36 of our series, and we'd like to thank Geico Careers for being our sponsor. Today's speaker is Gwen Applebaum. She is the Assistant Director of the UB School of Management Career Resource Center, and her topic today is leading by mentoring, giving better advice than find your passion. Uh, Gwen manages our career development internships and employee partnerships. She also serves on the Board of Trustees for Buffalo Collegiate Charter School, so she has a wealth of experience to share with us today. Uh, let's turn it over to Gwen, and if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat, and we'll get to them at the end. All right, thank you, and enjoy, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Happy Monday. Thank you for joining. Uh, we are beginning with a leading by mentoring discussion, giving better advice than find your passion. Uh, I built this presentation with the idea that it would be useful for those that may be mentoring uh, others with career development needs, but I also built it for people who might want to be a little inspired for their own career. So you'll get a little bit of both here. Um, this is a very timely uh, topic uh, as so many are questioning their work life these days. I see it every day in my job and particularly with alumni reaching out for help. Uh, Gallup research shows that 48% of employees are actively job searching right now. Uh, we see articles about the great resignation regularly. Uh, the level of people leaving their jobs is newsworthy on a regular basis, and there's more to come. Uh, in the wake of a global pandemic, people are questioning, what is the meaning of work? Uh, am I really happy? Uh, how am I valued at work? And what am I willing to trade off? So um, people want to know that uh, they want something different, but in so many cases, they're not at all certain what that might be. So why exactly is find your passion bad advice? Uh, we've been groomed to think about passion since we were growing up and hearing things like, do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life. Uh, you know, you probably heard that one all the way through to graduation ceremonies that talk about finding or following your passion. And to be clear, having passion and enthusiasm in your work is certainly not a bad thing. Now, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, the issue is more with the finding and following part. Um, for those of us in life design, which I'll talk about in a minute, this is what's called a dysfunctional belief. The idea that you need to find your one true passion. Uh, for many, that question, what's your passion is, is intimidating. The implication is that you should have a singular driving passion. And if you don't, there might be something wrong with you. Uh, Bill Damon is a researcher at Stanford and has studied this question. And it turns out that only 20% of us is estimated to have a single passion that we can articulate. Uh, the other 80% of us do not. Uh, Adam Graham from Wharton has written about this and he has a fabulous podcast. And I encourage you to take a look at it called The Perils of Following Your Career Passion. And it highlights how people often find their passions through doing work and developing them, but it's not something often followed or found. Um, Carol Dweck is another one uh, you, that names might be familiar because of her pioneering with her uh, colleagues, the idea of growth mindset and fixed mindset. And uh, she talks about the question of passion and it relates it more, uh, talks about more curiosity is the key to purposeful work and might even lead to passion. But passion usually doesn't come first. And yet we keep asking this question that leaves 80% of us stuck. So, you know, are you stuck? Is someone you know stuck? And how do we get unstuck? And if finding the passion isn't the answer, if finding that passion isn't the answer, what can you do instead? What advice may be more useful? Uh, and are there frameworks that can be helpful? So while Bill Burnett and Dave Evans had an idea about how to tackle this, uh, both were product designers at Apple and they began to wonder if the same way that Silicon Valley was using design thinking to problem solve and design products, couldn't those same frameworks be used to tackle the problem solving of career and life design? Uh, they were also professors at Stanford and dealing with a number of students that were picking their brains for career advice and decided to create a class called Designing Your Life after seeing students really struggle. And it quickly became one of the most popular electives at Stanford. 
and led to the best-selling book, Designing Your Life. Um, I, that the book absolutely spoke to me when I read it several years ago, uh, particularly given the work that I'm in and knowing the challenges that people have in finding work that's meaningful and that gives them happiness and creating a life that's meaningful and gives them happiness. And so uh, I decided that I wanted to participate all in and I joined the Life Design Studio program at Stanford, which is what you're seeing here and absolutely loved it. And so now I'm, uh, in a, I'm, I'm preaching the same uh, out there as well about life design. So what is, you know, design thinking is, as we would say in life design is a good approach to solving wicked problems. And uh, not just problems in terms of innovating and developing new products, but life problems, vocational wayfinding, career uh, wayfinding, educational, continuous learning. Uh, it was made famous by David Kelly, founder of D School and the product design from IDEO, as many of you probably know, because design thinking has exploded everywhere. Um, and if, just briefly, if you're not familiar, what is design thinking? Well, sometimes it's helpful to think about different kinds of thinking. Uh, to help differentiate it. You know, there's engineering thinking, you know, and these are generalities, please bear with me, but engineering thinking, solving your way forward. Um, there's usually, you know, maybe there's even one right answer to building a bridge or the optimal answer. And so you, you solve that problem. Um, with business thinking, optimizing your way forward by, you know, optimizing profits or customer satisfaction or both or more. Uh, research thinking, you're uh, experimenting and analyzing your way forward. And then with design thinking, you're really building your way forward. So uh, the approach where problems are solved um, through an iterative process and you're finding the problem is just as important as trying to solve that problem and prototyping your way into better and better solutions. Building is thinking. And so there's a design thinking process that we can translate over to life design. And so this is what it looks like. And you begin with, uh, this process where it starts off with empathy, uh, empathize, but instead of, in the case of life design, instead of empathizing with the user or the customer as you would in product design, you're empathizing with yourself. You're getting to know yourself, what's important to you, what your values are, and then define. Uh, as I said, life designers like to spend a lot of time defining the problem. So you're avoiding the things like gravity problems and anchor problems, things that can't be solved, or in the case of anchor problems, where there's a solution baked in that's causing you to make assumptions. I wrote a blog article a couple of weeks ago um, for the school's on leadership blog and talked about the fact that an anchor problem might be something like, I, um, I wanna be a leader, but my boss isn't retiring any time soon, so I can't be a leader. Well, there's a problem, there's a, there's a solution that's baked in that's holding you back from looking at what other problems may be out there. So, you know, so don't let gravity problems that you can't solve or anchor problems get in the way of this process being productive. And then ideating, making sure that before you narrow in too quickly on one solution, that you're really opening yourself up to a number of different possibilities. So um, you're uh, thinking about uh, not too narrowly, like, you know, you say, you know, for a student, I often say, yo, if you love animals, well, that doesn't mean that you just have to choose between being a vet or being a zookeeper. You know, what are the other ideation possibilities out there? And making sure that you're not um, letting that sneaky judgment or assumptions weigh in and inhibit your creativity. And then when you're ready, start prototyping and testing. And that's really where the magic happens with design thinking is the process of getting unstuck and moving forward by testing things out. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So the only difference with life design is that we add a little stage at the beginning, which is called accept. And you want to accept where you are, maybe some limitations that you have, maybe money limitations, maybe family limitations or things like that, and understand that that may constrain you and that's okay. And you, that factors into the process. The other piece that's important to understand with design thinking are these fantastic mindsets that, de that designers use to help them make progress. And when you see these, um, you'll understand how they're useful in life design as well. Radical collaboration. You know, don't just get in your own head, use other people, whether or not it's your personal board of directors, your network. And radical means make sure you have diverse perspectives. Um, reframing, we just talked a little bit about that. So an example of that would be a dysfunctional belief. We would, my passion is out there for me to find. Well, that may be getting you stuck. So let's reframe that into something that'll help you solve your way forward and 
say passions develop over time by trying things out. So don't put that pressure on initially, you know, that they can evolve. My passion may be out there just waiting to be developed. And I'm going to get there by just trying things. Um, and then we talk about mindfulness of the process, understanding where you are. Don't, uh, you know, narrow in and start testing out before you've really ideated things like that. Bias towards action, making sure there's, there's a great uh, study, a marshmallow challenge where they had um, MBAs and lawyers and doctors and engineers and kindergartners try to build a tower with a marshmallow. And time and time again, guess who wins? The kindergartners. And the kindergartners win because they have a bias towards action. They don't spend a lot of time planning. They keep trying, trying and failing and trying and failing, but that trying and failing helps them not get too stuck and helps them move forward. And the research shows that they tend to win. <laughs> so, you know, keeping that in mind, you know, that don't get too locked up in thinking, 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 and not um, taking action to try to help and test out some of your ideas. And then finally, curiosity. Best-selling author Elizabeth Gilbert uh, said, if someone says follow your, she goes so far as to say, you know, if someone says follow your passion, they've actually harmed you. Uh, it makes you feel excluded, like a failure. And curiosity though, taps you on your shoulder very lightly and makes you turn your head around and examine something a little more closely. Curiosities can be mild, strange, almost nothing that you can even miss if you are waiting for a big sign. It gives you clues, not a destination. And that's a great segue into the three things that I wanna leave you with. Um, you might say, I need something more concrete when than clues. Uh, but so often we're so quick to rush to a destination um, and maybe the big help would be just finding some direction. So how do we do that? Okay, so you know this is a big concept. We've got limited time. And so I really wanted to emphasize three ideas that might be better ideas for you than find your passion if you're giving out advice. And one of them, the first one, is build a compass. With design thinking, um, you, 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 we're gonna start at this, this beginning with the accept and empathize phase and get to know yourself before you launch into some of these other steps that we're talking about. And what ways do you get to know yourself? Well, first, I go through these exercises a lot of times with our students and alumni, and we work through your work view. You know, why work? Understand why is it important to you and what do you wanna get out of it? What are your values when it comes to work? What's it for? What's it mean? Um, what makes it worthwhile to you? In the same token, even bigger question, what's your worldview? Why are we here? What is the meaning or purpose of life, of death? You know, get in touch with your values. For students, this is often big when I, it's hard to say, what are your values? Um, well, one of the things that you can do is think about the milestones in your life. And then I ask when you say, okay, think of a milestone. Why did you choose it as a milestone? Because that will tell you something about why it's important to you and what your values are. For me, one of the biggest milestones I had is the first day that I, the day I got my first job. It stands out to me, career was so important. I was so excited to be independent. And I should have known that later on in life, because this is my, about my third career, that career work, running a career office would be something that would be in line with something that is so important and considered meaningful work to me. Now, those are big questions. There's some other ways to kind of get in touch with who you are and what's important to you. And we go through flow exercises as well. Some of you may be familiar um, with this book related to positive psychology. Um, and if you've ever been in flow, you, you, you know it when you hear it, time stands still. You could spend hours and it feels like minutes. You're completely involved, it feels worthwhile to you. You have clarity, serenity, all those types of things. Um, it's funny because Mark Cuban was one of those people that was talking about passion. He said, rather than following your passion, follow your effort. Look at where you apply your time. I was never into technology in college. I took one computer class and cheated at it, if you recall. And when I got one of my first jobs at a school using technology, I was like, wait, I love this. I've taught myself the program. I could go for seven, eight hours without taking a break and think it was 10 minutes uh, because I was concentrating so hard and so excited and really loved it. Well, what he's describing is flow. And it tells you, and it goes back to what we've been talking about in terms of the fact that, you know, he didn't, technology was not the initial passion that he was, that he had defined. It was something that he developed. He got good at it. A lot of times we love things that we're good at and we're good at what we like. You know, we like what we're good at and we're good at what we like. So sometimes those things go hand in hand and really evolve into passion. So, and all of that to get into coherence. 
and who you are, what you do, what you believe, it's all connected. And connecting those dots can help give you meaning and help give you that direction, that compass. That compass isn't going to give you a destination, but it will give you a direction. And that can be really, really helpful. Um, so a second idea, ideate possibilities. Um, so as I said before, so many times we, we rush into the focus. You know, we, we assume that one thing is led to another when it comes to career and that the, the opportunities are narrow as opposed to opening ourselves up for, you know, being curious, maybe some divergent thinking, brainstorming. Before you converge on those focus areas, really think about what else may be out there and lean on others to help you. Um, I'm not saying you need to be open to all possibilities because that can be destructive as well, but at some point you have to start narrowing down, but get out some of those potential ideas first. How many lives are in you? Um, and there's a dysfunctional belief that there's only one right answer for that question. And, and that's another thing you have to find that, you know, you have to be the best version of you as opposed to thinking that there can be many versions of you. And, um, and the fact that you need to reframe again and, and understand that there's a, a lot of amazing possibilities and any one of them could be good. So um, one of the things that um, I typically do in some of these life design workshops is think about Odyssey plants. And you know, I had done them as part of the life design studio. And you, you, know, you kind of jump in and you say, okay, let's figure out three five-year plans. And we're gonna do it in like a 10 minute period, which is intimidating, right? But the three five-year plans are going to be, okay, life number one, what's the story you tell today? Life number two, what if life number one were gone? Life number three, release all constraints. And you know, not, you don't have money constraints, you don't have M image constraints, status, resources, anything, what would you do? And this is kind of an idea of way to get your best ideas by getting at all of the ideas. And so here's what some of those Odyssey plans can look like. You know, they're all different. There's a little bit of a dashboard down at the bottom that says, okay, do I have the resources for this? Do I like it? You know, do I have the confidence that I could do it? Is it coherent with what we just talked about in terms of that, that meaning, that compass that we talked about? So, you know, these are useful ideas and exercises to go through. I did it myself, and we'll talk in a minute uh, about some of the things that I decided I wanted to prototype and test. But the takeaways for this is that odysseys are mini prototypes of future possibilities. And we test them out to iterate and learn, uh, just like you would in product design. And, and you know, more alternatives are better than one. So you have more ideas to be able to choose from. And again, bounce these ideas off of other people, that radical collaboration. Uh, it was so helpful when I was in the lab, even talking with people that didn't know me very well, they sensed some of the things that I was most passionate about that linked across my three Odyssey plans and were really able to give me some constructive feedback. And so then we move on to the third idea, which is to encourage trying things. Um, and I know that sounds simple, but so often we don't do it. We don't do some of these risk reducing measures like prototyping uh, before we launch into a new career. Uh, again, bias towards action, but prototype first. Um, so for me, I wanted to prototype writing a book. Always wanted to write a book, write a novel. Do I think I can do it? And so when we were talking about what things might I do to prototype it, um, well, those prototypes had to be kind of changed. <laughs> that sounds like my dog, but my dog's not here. So um, cheap, quick, and easy. So, you know, what can you do? Well, in this case, someone told me, they said, well, Gwen, write a short story. If you can't write a short story, you're certainly not going to be able to write a novel. Well, you're right. That's a, it, it's a quicker way to be able to test out whether or not I'm actually going to be able to do it. And another one said, you know what, I have a publisher. If you want to talk about just the, the what you're up against in terms of trying to get this done. Um, and so maybe a prototype conversation, maybe a prototype experience. Those are things, informational interviewing, networking, all of those things really help get you out of that, you know, inner quandary about whether or not something's right for you. Um, the prototypes, they reduce risk, as I said, uh, the risk of diving into a new career and realizing oh, that's not for me before you kind of test out and expose some of the assumptions that you may be making, romanticizing a career that, you know, may not be exactly what you think it is, and engaging others with your ideas. Uh, again, it's collaborative sport here, this, uh, this life design, and learn, 
just never stop learning. This is a lifelong process. You know, when we talk about that, that, that design thinking process, it really should be circular because it never really stops. We're going through it constantly throughout life. And that's what makes it so valuable is that it's not one and done. Um, and I, what I'll end on is by saying, I've talked a lot about, you know, the problem solving in life. And I really like uh, some of the, the sentiments associated with life design that, okay, we, we know we're problem solving, but this really, let's, let's describe it what it is. And what it should be is this adventure to be engaged in. And in this case, you know, don't get stuck in, in finding your passion and try to build your way forward you know, by using this design in your life and keep those things in mind. Build a compass, ideate possibilities and try things. So, and that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Gwen. Uh, thank you for your emphasis on mentoring. I'm a big believer in mentoring and that people should have mentors in all areas of your life. And here I see a question from Michael. What advice do you have for locating a mentor who might be younger or for an older professional making a career change? You know, it's really interesting. I was just hearing about, you know, sometimes in, in the workplace, uh, there was, uh, I was meeting with one of our current MBA students who's on the job and said, and I know one of our large employers here locally has a reverse mentor program where you can actually get someone who's younger to help uh, kind of maybe educate you in some intergenerational issues, some technology issues, maybe things like that. But if you're not working at an employer that might have that, um, I would say that whether or not it's volunteer work or whether or not it's through some of the organizations that are out there, like, you know, even inclusive organizations like Buffalo Negra Partnership and things like that, where there's great networking opportunities and getting to know people that um, might be out of your day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, I'll put in a big, for me, I, you know, there have been some really key moments where I've been able to get out of because I throw myself, I tend to throw myself into my work and throw myself into my family. And so I've really looked for those opportunities to get out of my day-to-day -day life and, and meet other people. Leadership Buffalo was great for me for that. And, uh, and there's definitely a lot of examples out there. Thanks, Gwen. We have a question from Cynthia. How can we learn more about career design? Wow. There's, you know, there's, first of all, Designing Your Life, I highly recommend the book. Um, there's, there's even some, um, you know, shorter form through uh, um, um, the, the website. If you were go to the Designing Your Life website, there are some videos that they have uh, that you can even get some bite-sized kind of modules to learn a little bit more about life design from uh, those founders of Designing Your Life. Um, and then, you know, I, I will tell you that they're not the only ones out there. There's certainly other schools of thought in life design. I know we even have here in the, um, um, the alumni office here at UB is offering with Mission Collaborative, a great program for kind of monthly life design as well for those that are interested. So, you know, there, it's, it's, it's all over. Um, and I can see why, because I think there's a lot of value in it. Well, thank you for a great morning with us, Gwen. And for anyone who'd like to rewatch the program or share it with their colleagues, we'll have it up on our website this week, along with all of our other speakers in the series this year. Uh, join us next week for Mark Klein, chairman of Hodgson Russ. He's gonna be talking about developing leadership competencies. You won't wanna miss it. Well, thanks everybody for joining us and have a great week.